Hey, going last, I don't know who I upset, but here I am. So who knows what a tension metric is? Who's got a mental operating model? No one? Great. So we believe really, really strongly that to be successful, you have to learn. And I read this amazing article a couple of years ago, two and a half, nearly three years ago, from the CEO at HubSpot. Uh, nine lessons he learned as a, as a HubSpot CEO. And one of the things he talked about was his vision or his role as the chief pothole prevention officer. He feels that one of his most important things to do is identify when something's gone wrong and then afterwards figure out what data they should have been looking at to prevent that happening again next time. You don't want to drive into the same pothole two or three or four months or years in a row. Uh, and this is something that we took on board uh, really early on and, and have worked really hard at. Um, we've grown very, very quickly, uh, and probably a bunch of you are sitting there thinking, whatever you're doing isn't relevant because we're a lot smaller than you, we're a different business. And I think it's really important to understand that context is critical. We're a B2B software business. There's a whole bunch of factors that influence the way that we operate our business that are probably not the same as yours. But I want to remind you that three years ago, we were less than a million dollars ARR. So that's probably relevant for a whole bunch of people in this room. And three years ago, we were doing a whole bunch of things I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to show you some stuff. And then I'm going to talk about uh, some specific worked examples of tension metrics that we've used. And some of them are going to be really obvious to you, probably embarrassingly obvious. Maybe we're just not that smart. But I figure it's good to be honest about, hey, this is a thing we did, and this is how it worked out badly, and this is how you could avoid it. Good? Here we go. So the first thing is that running a SaaS business is kind of always firefighting. There's always something going wrong, and very often there's multiple things going wrong at the same time. And one of the biggest challenges, in my opinion, is making sure that you run towards the fire that will kill you if you don't put it out, and not running towards the other fire that's burning that won't kill you. Right? When you're growing very quickly, this is much, much worse. It looks like this. Uh, there's a whole tire fire going on around you. You just don't know what to do. So where do you focus your attention? How do you think about the problems that you're facing? One of the challenges is all SaaS businesses, at least ones that don't have higher churn than they have customer acquisition, have compound growth. Right? All of them. No matter how quickly your business is growing or not growing, you have got a compound growth business. And it's very hard to correlate cause and effect in compound growth. Human brains are not designed to understand compound growth or exponential growth. We don't have good intuition around these things. And as a result, it's very hard to know, hey, like we changed this thing, we released this feature, or we made this change to our sales process, or we ran this marketing campaign. How do we measure the input to the output? It's very, very, very difficult to tie those two things together. There's a whole system going on here. I love systems theory. Bruce, the chairman, is out there somewhere, and he's a systems guy. He loves it. Um, but you know, if marketing come up with this blinder of a campaign, I originally tried to make this animated, and I had technical difficulties, which is embarrassing for an engineer to say. So you just have to look at a static picture. But if, you, if your marketing team have a blinder of a campaign and generate tons of leads, then the first order effects are that the sales team are going to be complaining about being overwhelmed. They're not going to be able to work all the leads, and they're going to be grumpy if you have an inside sales model, and they're going to be tense. But two or three or four or five months later, you're going to find that there's third and fourth and fifth order effects happening in your implementation and success teams where they're dealing with this ongoing deluge and tidal wave of stuff that moved through your system and blew things up. And it can be very, very hard if you don't have the right business metrics in place to identify, whoa, like what's causing this? Has something gone wrong recently that's broken this, or is this an effect? of something that happened two or three or four months ago. Does that make sense? All right, who knows who this is? Does anyone recognize this guy? Feynman, right? I love this guy. He's one of my heroes. Uh, and so the geeks have this joke about Feynman. There's this, there was another physicist who, who joked about it. Feynman had this ability to come up with solutions to problems that seemed intractable to all the other smart people in the room in very unusual ways. And so there's this thing called the Feynman algorithm for solving hard problems. Have you come across this? It goes like this. You write the problem down, you think really hard, and then you write down the answer. <laughs> right? It works really good. And unfortunately, the bad news that I've got for you today is that I'm telling you about the Feynman algorithm for business metrics. You can't copy the examples that I'm going to give you because they're not good examples for you. Your context is yours. But you do need to do really hard thinking. So the first thing I want to say is this is not a tool problem. You don't need fancy dashboards. You don't need fancy BI and analytics suites and all sorts of stuff. I am a big fan of embarrassing, embarrassingly naive solutions. 
right? We do things that seem really, really naive, and we keep on doing them, and the thing that's really surprising is they often work for a lot longer than you would expect them to reasonably. In some cases, three, four, five years later, after we've made a decision to do something really simple, we find that it's still working really, really well. So don't overinvest. The hard thing here is the thinking, not the tools. Like the questions before that Mark and, and the Clear Capital guys were asking, like Excel still gets a huge amount of the world's work done. Don't let someone sell you a fancy dashboard. It won't do your thinking for you. Do the thinking first and then figure out what you need after that. Right, so this is the dashboard that we used for all of our product metrics for the first two and a half, of, two and a half years that I was at PushPay. Um, some, some people call these North Star metrics. These are the metrics that measure the value that you're creating for your customers. So some of them are kind of our measures, but most of them are like how much customer value has, have our customers, because the way our product works is that we sell a product to our customers, and then they recruit users, and those users make payments or they use apps, and the value that they get are the number of users they've managed to start using the stuff that we sold them. Does that make sense? B to B to C. Um, so for us, user recruitment and the number of transactions that those users were doing, the number of app downloads, things like that, are all really important. This is how we tracked it. Once a week, someone ran a really ghetto SQL query, took the results, put it into Excel, and then Paul Shingles, who was our COO at the time, would get his whiteboard marker out, erase off the things, and write the new numbers up. Two and a half years, we would have a meeting every week to talk about product performance. This is what we used. You don't need fancy things if you've got the right numbers in front of you. I can't tell you what the right numbers are for your business, but you should start thinking about, am I measuring how my product is doing in terms of creating value for my customers? Why is that important? It's important because customers that are getting value for your product don't churn, right? This evolved, and, and later on, uh, about a year after I showed you that, we had a, a slide deck with maybe 40 slides in it that measured some of the key functional areas across the business. I've had to redact a whole bunch of information here. It's a couple of years old, but I still figured it was prudent. But um, that's because the chairman's here. I've got to be you know, public company responsible. Uh, but for every functional area in the business, we've got a slide with a couple of key metrics after it that measure things. And then when there was something that has gone wrong, we included additional slides that provided additional insight into what was going on. So here's the framework that we used to do this. Normally, when you start, you think about lagging metrics, output metrics. How are we doing at making new sales? Right, is a really classic question. How, much, how many new sales do we make, or how much MRR do we add in the month, or the week, or the quarter, however you want to think about it. But this is an output metric. It doesn't predict whether or not things are going wrong. It only tells you afterwards that things have gone wrong. Oh, we missed the number for the month. What are the metrics that we can look at that will be leading metrics that help us indicate whether or not we're on track to get there? You with me? So the second thing we think about are leading metrics. What are the metrics that help indicate whether we're on track? The problem with leading metrics is that they're incomplete. We don't know the outcome of a process yet. And so the third type of metrics, and the reason that the talk is named what it is, uh, what we call tension metrics, right? What are metrics that help keep this thing honest? About two SaaS products ago, I worked for a company who had a marketing department that probably didn't have the right mix of people in it. And they, we used to have this weekly meeting where we reviewed all the metrics across all the business. It was very exciting. And the marketing department said, hey, we've made this change, and website visits are up like 4,000%, which was great. There was no tension metric for that. And if we had thought about it, we probably could have had one. There's a really obvious tension metric for website visits, which would be bounce rate, how many people just visit the website and then don't do anything, they close the window and move on. Um, what happened was the website visits were up like 4,000%, but the bounce rate was like 99% because we'd put a link in the wrong place and people were coming to look at it that weren't interested in our products at all. And the problem is we got really excited about all these website visits, but nothing ever turned into sales. So the second or third thing, apart from think really hard and, and have some metrics that you have a way of predicting, is you need to review these regularly. We do this every week. Every week, the senior leadership team cross-functionally gets together and goes through all the key departmental metrics. It doesn't take very long. It takes maybe 20 or 30 minutes to review them all. And it gives us a chance to identify cross-functional breakdowns in the organization and put together a small group of people to go away and work on a specific problem that we've identified. If you're not doing this, then I think you're being reckless. And you, we were doing this when we were 20 or 30 people and quite a lot smaller. And it's even more critical now than it was then, but it was absolutely critical then to make sure that we actually could fix things quickly when they broke and identify issues. All right, so just to reemphasize, this is a thinking problem. All right, so when we first started, 2014, one of the first metrics that we started tracking 
uh, was closed bookings. How many new sales do we make this month? It's a good metric. There's some really obvious problems with it, and I don't want to get into a discussion around sales operations in detail. It's a, someone could probably do like a whole week just on sales operations metrics. Uh, you should read about this. There are lots of people that know a lot more about this than I do. Um, in fact, you might be wondering why I'm up here talking about sales metrics at all. Aren't, aren't I an engineer? And the answer is yes, I am an engineer. One of the things uh, that I've learned as an engineer, I really, really like building SaaS products. I really enjoy it. Uh, and what I've figured out is that if I like building SaaS products, then making sure that the business is going to stay in business so I can keep on working on it is a really good pastime. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't get to build that SaaS product anymore. And I've done that a couple of times, and it's a real bummer. So this is why I'm passionate about this. All right, so closed bookings was a metric we looked at. Very quickly, uh, we realized there was an incomplete metric. Uh, we had a, num a, week, uh, sorry, a month where we made the number but we had not added as much recurring revenue as we wanted, and so our ACMR wasn't where we wanted our target to be. And so we added a tension metric to say, hey, like, okay, the number of bookings is important, but also the MRR added in that month is really important as well. This should be really obvious, embarrassingly obvious. I'm trying to air dirty laundry here, right? But then another problem became apparent, which was, what is our average deal size? Like, okay, like we made the MRR number, we didn't make the CB number, like what's going on in terms of like our average sale ticket size? to make sure that that's trending in the direction that we want. Later on, as we started to think about this a bit more, we started to get really sophisticated about the idea that we had certain types of customers that we wanted to acquire. So we have customers that pay us $100 a month, and we have customers that pay us $10,000 a month. Quite a big range of customer sizes, small, medium, and large, you can think about it. And we have to be really careful that we don't overserve the small ones and we don't underserve the big ones. And in order to build a sustainable business, we want to make sure we've got a good mix of different customer sizes. So we had targets internally, and so we started reporting on what are the mix of bookings, not just did we make the number and is the MRR there, but is it the ratio that we expected or that we're aiming for based on how marketing are doing, how our sales team are doing, et cetera. A little bit later, uh, we thought we really had this dialed, and then we noticed a different problem, which was that um, our customers are largely churches, and churches tend to be staffed by quite nice people. And salespeople, well, salespeople are motivated by specific things. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be pejorative. They, like, I love salespeople. We wouldn't be here without them, or at least if you need inside sales. But um, our salespeople were very good at keeping people on the phone until they agreed to sign a deal. And so what was happening was some of our customers, or at least potential customers, were signing contracts just to get off a phone call. Which, you know, if you're a really good salesperson, is probably a win, but it's not a great win for our business. And so what we found was that we had this dropout occurring post-sale, but pre-go-live pre or pre-implementation. And so we started tracking how long is it taking to get a customer from signing a contract to actually getting on the call to go live. And is this indicating a problem with our sales incentives or whatever else? This led to a whole bunch of comp changes, how we, how we paid commission, all sorts of important sales op stuff. But I'm just trying to share with you like the thinking process that we go through as we do this. All right, let's look at another worked example here. Click. Oh, OK. Our customer success team is, is literally world class. We've won Stevie Awards, I think, every year for the last four years about how great our customer service is. And we're really good at taking customers that are enthusiastic about having bought our product and started to pay us money and getting them using it quickly. And we had this target that we wanted customers fully implemented within 60 days. We have a definition of that. And so the, the reporting metric for customer success was Average days of implementation, and it was sitting right around 30. Everything's great, except that we started hearing anecdotally from some larger customers that they were really, really unhappy with the quality of our implementation. They didn't like the service that they were getting, and they didn't think that we were doing a good job with them. And as we dug into it, what we found was that averages are terrible, terrible metrics if they don't have tensions on them. Because they're averages, they don't tell you about outliers. Does that make sense? So anytime you ever see a metric that's an average, you need to immediately think in your head, ah, have I got an appropriate tension on this to measure this? The solution was really simple. We started reporting in our weekly report the number of customers over 60 days that had not finished their implementation process. It highlighted the problem really clearly for the management team. It helped our customer success team focus on that. We were able to drive that down really, really effectively. We did a second thing because we had these large customers, as I mentioned, that are paying us a lot of money compared to the average customer value. And we added a separate uh, kind of piece of the report 
that just monitors what we call top shelf implementations. So the idea here is that there's like five or 10 really large customers in implementation at any given point in time. And we want to know a detailed breakdown on a per customer basis of how their implementation is tracking, because that's so significant for us. It was a really easy thing to do, and it meant that we stopped having these kind of backwards and forwards about where's this and where's that and what's, where's whatever else. All right, here's my next example. We have a really, really great support team. They're super passionate. They work really hard. And for a long time, we've been reporting average ticket resolution time. What did I say about averages? Yeah. <laughs> They're poor metrics. For a long time, we've been reporting uh, an average ticket resolution time of around two hours, which is actually incredible. And it is very good. The issue is that if you just measure this, then your agents are incentivized to solve the quick tickets quickly and ignore the hard ones. Right? They're not trying to be malicious, it's just the way humans work. You set up an incentive and then things respond in the system in relationship to that incentive that you've set up. So the first thing we did is we introduced a ratio of new tickets to resolve tickets or solve tickets. And that helped us understand whether or not work was piling up in that team or whether or not they were actually clearing their workload over time. But it didn't give us quite as much fidelity as we wanted on how that team was performing. So we added a second metric, which was the percentage of tickets that went over our total SLA, which was sort of two or three times our response time, depending on how it looked. So if tickets were taking more than eight business hours to resolve, they'd be SLA breached. As soon as we added this, the problem became very crystal. Uh, the average re resolution time was two hours. But SLA breached was 30%, right? There's no magic bullet here apart from thinking really hard, right, Feynman? All right, now before uh, we get into this, churn is obviously a big thing for SaaS companies. I don't think of any, I can think of any SaaS product in the world that doesn't have some churn. And as you grow, you're going to get more churn, which is why it's important to think about churn as a percentage, right? But I hope you all know, or at least some of you know, that there's two types of churn. There's logo churn and revenue churn. And if you're only looking at one and not both, then you don't necessarily have an appropriate tension metric in place. Logo churn is the number of customers that have left. So if I have 100 customers and one leaves, I have 1% logo churn. If I have $10,000 worth of MRR and I lose $1,000, then I've got 10% no, revenue churn. And you need to look at both of these and hold them in tension because if you have a range of deal sizes, you can end up thinking, hey, I'm really good, my logo churn is really light, or my revenue churn is really light, but actually have a big problem. For us, we started to get more nuanced about this. As we grow, you get a lot more customers, and so you see churn go up. And the percentage didn't necessarily go up, but certainly the number of churned customers went up as we added customers. And so we started thinking about how to investigate and report on whether or not the churn that we were seeing was problematic churn or not. But in order for us to do that, we had to define a customer health metric. So we took a very, very naive approach to this, embarrassingly naive. We decided there was going to be a score, a customer health score, that ranges from zero to four. Zero means you have not used the product at all in the last 30 days. Four means you're using the product at about the level that we would expect given your size. Three means you're using it a little bit below that. Two means you're using it a bit. One means you have used it even once or twice in the last 30 days. So zero and one are not good scores. They're really, really bad scores. Three and four, things are probably okay. And in the middle, you've got this kind of like gray zone. You might be in implementation or whatever else. But what we did then is started bucketing customers, churn customers by health score, so that we can talk about, do we have a churn problem with customers that are really well implemented and are using our product well? Or do we have a churn problem with customers that are not using our product well or have never implemented it or haven't used it recently? There's a whole bunch of nuance and complexity here, and it depends on your product and your business as to how you think about this. Don't copy this, but use this as a way to think about how you're thinking about this stuff. The other nice thing about doing this is as soon as we did it, it became really obvious we should be doing this not just for churned customers, but for unchurned customers, and it became a way of us measuring the effectiveness of our implementation teams. Here we go. All right, so to recap, bring it in for a landing. One, think hard. Two, find your leading metrics and your tension metrics. If you don't have both, you're likely going to end up in a hole. And three, review them weekly. That's it.